If I read correctly, you're going to be 75 this year. Yes. How many years have you been thinking and writing? Oh, gosh. I've been published since 1960. Has it changed at all, the way you learn? Not really. I mean, I, I learn both from reading and from experience. And, of course, what I believe has changed radically since I was a, uh, a Marxist in my 20s. I'm surprised, though, when I go back, because I keep old letters and things, I'm surprised how many of the values I had are still the same values. It's just that now I see that they have to be reached by an entirely different math method. We're at the Hoover Institution. What is it? Hoover Institution is a think tank. Uh, established originally just as an archive for all the tons of material that Herbert Hoover collected when he was traveling around Europe after the First World War uh, during a time of starvation where he uh, set up this program to feed millions of people across Europe. And when he came back, he dumped all this stuff here at Stanford uh, and set up this archive. And then at some point, uh, Glenn Campbell, one of the directors, decided to turn it into a think tank and he put it on the map as that. How long have you been here? It'll be 25 years in September. What's like life like here for you? I shouldn't even be answering that because uh, I am here so seldom. I work at home miles away, uh, but that's part of the, the great part of the freedom of the place. I mean, right now, if you ask the director of the Hoover Institution, what is Tom Sowell working on? He'd say, darn if I know. You know, uh, from time to time, they find out what I'm working on, and if they like it, I continue to stay on. I suppose if they went a couple of years and I did nothing, they'd say, why is he here? Uh, but uh, it's, it's really a wonderful place, and I've had the most productive years of my life here. Has your relationship with your readers changed much? Not that I can think of. Um, mo most of the stuff I get from readers is really very positive, very reinforcing. Some of it's very touching. Uh, occasionally, you'll get a uh, barrage of criticism on something. Uh, I had one recently where uh, there's some internet website that is sicking them on me uh, because I said there's no such thing as a trickle-down theory. Nobody has ever advocated it. And there were all storms of email came in, not one of which contained one quote from one person who had actually advocated it. It's one of those things that someone says that he objects to in someone else, but we can never find the someone else who's supposed to have said it. In reading a little bit of your personal autobiography, there was a scene where you were on top of the World Trade Center a number of years ago. Oh, yes. Having a dinner. I was having dinner with a man that I would worked for decades earlier in a machine shop in New York at really the low point of my life. And I, was, uh, I didn't have enough money to ride the New York subway, which was five cents in those days. And so I would walk from the Brooklyn Bridge up to Harlem because I didn't have the subway fare. And uh, when I got paid, uh, they held back a couple of days, which normally doesn't mean anything, but when you're in that position, it means a lot. And so I had to ask him to borrow some money so I would have something to eat with. And he let me five bucks, which, which was real money in those days. Uh, and so when I came back there, and I was looking out of the hotel window that I was in, and I looked over to where I used to work, and I thought about him, and I phoned him. And uh, he brought his family, and we ate dinner at the top of the World Trade Center. And it was really one of the best uh, evenings of my life. And uh, he and I were both on the verge of tears when we, when we parted. It was just a wonderful time. Irving Crystal told you a couple years ago, uh, or a lot of years ago, that if you, the, the worst thing about running for office uh, is that you might get elected. Oh, absolutely, and he was absolutely right. Did you, how, how much did you think about running? Uh, I thought about it only until I f talked with the first professionals. I mean, the Senator Hayakawa wanted me to run for the Senate in California. And out of uh, respect for him, I, I agreed, just I thought it never crossed my mind before. Uh, or, or sense. Uh, but uh, out of respect for him, I talked to p political professionals. And these people would talk to me about two minutes, and they would say, y y y you're not what politicians are made of. Uh, my uh, late sister, who probably knew me better than anyone in the world, said, Tommy, I can't even imagine you in politics. I can't even imagine. And once, uh, and while my wife was telling a friend, uh, Tom wouldn't last 20 minutes in Washington, and uh, he said, oh, yes, he would. No, I'm not saying he'd last an hour. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Why? Because I say what I mean, uh, and uh, that doesn't help you a lot in politics. Um, you know, so they, they tried to get me to become a, a secretary of, of uh, labor when, when Reagan came. There were people who were pushing that, and I told the guy, stop pushing it, you know. I said, you know, the President of the United States has better things to do than having to run around all the time saying, well, what Tom really meant was, you know, after I make some statement. What kind of person then goes into politics? I don't really know. Um, I just don't know. It, it, ha it has to be someone who's either enormously dedicated or who is enormously uh, 
concern with power, prominence, and those kinds of things. When we last talked on Book Notes in 1990, mm -hmm. you had written something like 14 books, and in the interim period, you've almost written that many again. It's over 30. Really? How do you go about, and I know you got another one coming out in a few days, mm -hmm. how do you go about staying on a schedule and writing as many books as you have? Actually, I don't stay on a schedule. Uh, I write when I have something to say. And uh, that, that can be, for example, the book, uh, Basic Economics, that I wrote, uh, that took shape over a period of a decade. I wasn't even sure when it would be finished. But as I would see things uh, written that, on TV that were actually just so wrong economically, I would then sit down and write something explaining this thing you know, in plain language. And over the years, the stuff would just collect in the computer. Uh, and after, you know, half a dozen or so years, I, I began to see, you know, we have almost enough here for a book. And then I began to organize it and turn it into a book. So I, I only write, and so I normally will have two or three things going at one time. Uh, and uh, uh, I have no idea which one will ever get finished at all, because there's some that will never get finished. Uh, and much less which one's going to come out first. So right now, for example, I have one book coming out uh, in a few weeks that you mentioned. I have another one uh, in press uh, with Yale University Press on a totally different subject, uh, essays on classical economics. What's a day like then for you? I have great, great uh, freedom since I, I, I don't have classes to teach, I don't have any things to, to any people to meet. Uh, uh, if on a given day I may do a lot or I may do nothing at all. I mean, I can remember once I was uh, sitting here and uh, I said, you know, I, I haven't been to Yosemite in a while. I just got out of the car and got in, the, got in the car and drove to Yosemite and stayed, uh, stayed the rest of the week. But how many columns a week do you have to write? Uh, I'm only, uh, uh, my contract calls for one a week. I usually write more than one. I don't get paid any more for the extra ones. If I'm truly, uh, you know, frothing at the mouth, I'll write uh, maybe three or four. How long does it take you to write a 750 word column? Again, it's hard to say because I have a whole bunch of them that are half written, and again, that, that will probably never be completely written. And sometimes something will happen in the news that will just jog me, and I'll sit down and do it in a couple of hours. Uh, another time, it'll just take, well, the random thoughts column can last, you know, it could be a couple of months before I collect enough for one of those. So you know, it's just very fluid. You were a Democrat in 1972, and yeah. you say you haven't been a member of a party since That's then. That's right. Why? Why'd you switch to uh, no party? Oh, McGovern. When I saw what happened to the Democrats under McGovern, I, I voted, uh, heaven help us, for McGovern in the, in the primaries in 1972 simply because I was so sick of the Vietnam War. But the more I saw of McGovern and the people around McGovern, the more I realized what a disaster it would be to have this man president. Uh, I didn't, uh, I, I, I was never a Nixon fan, and so in 1972 I didn't vote at all. Which president offered you the Federal Trade Commissioner's job? Uh, president Ford. What were the circumstances? Uh, they had a vacancy, it was, it was 1976, and they offered it to me. And I agreed to take it on condition that uh, if there's any opposition that uh, arises, they let me know I'll withdraw because I don't have time to play Washington games. And uh, I kept calling there and asking and the guy at the White House who's handling this, uh, is there any, I don't hear anything, what's going on? And he said, oh, no, no, it's just taking time. And eventually I was in Washington, so I went up to the Hill and talked to the, uh, the uh, staffer of this committee that handled this. And uh, he said, uh, we've gone over your record with a fine tooth comb. We can find nothing to object to. And therefore, we're just not going to hold hearings. Because this is an election year, we expect our guy is going to be elected, and he'll appoint his own man. What burned me was that he said, and I, and I said, did you tell the White House this? He said, we told the White House this months ago. And I went back to the guy at the White House, and I said, I just talked to this fellow on the Hill, and either he's lying or you're lying. Which is it? And he started hemming and hawing, and I turned and walked out. I sent them a one-line one uh, uh, withdrawal letter from the hotel on Hotel Stationery, and, and that was the end of it. You got your undergraduate degree from Harvard in what? Economics. You got your master's degree from? Columbia in economics. And you got your PhD? PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. And at Chicago, Milton Friedman was your advisor? Yes. What did he teach you that you still hold on to today? I guess it really what, what, he, what he taught was uh, rigorous methods of thinking. I remember one of the questions he asked on an exam was, define marginal revenue. Now that's a question you would ask in economics one, you see. And so I thought, well, nobody got full credit for the answer. I was lucky to be one of the few that got partial credit. Because you know, there are all kinds of sloppy ways of defining marginal revenue, which then leads you into all kinds of fallacies. 
Uh, and so you, you learn, no, you define it the way it ought to be, and that way you avoid a whole mess of stuff that you, you don't want to get into. What do you say somebody watching this says, Tom Sowell lives in an ivory tower. He, he lives in that Hoover institution. He doesn't have contact with these kind of people. How do you know these people? Uh, have it, well, I, I was 50 years old when I came to the Hoover Institution, so it was not I, I was a, uh, uh, a young lad uh, uh, fresh out of school. And uh, I grew up in far worse poverty than most people uh, today uh, who are considered to be in poverty. If we saw you in your habitat writing, what would we see? Oh, you, you would see, a, a, first of all, a mess in the office. Uh, this is home. Home. And, uh, 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 and you see me at the computer with my Windows 95 uh, and uh, uh, just struggling with stuff, that's all. And what time of day would you be doing most of your writing? I, I have no schedule because I have no classes, I have no office hours and so on. And so it's whenever. And so uh, around, oh, I guess around 2, 2 o'clock this morning I was working, but at 8.30 this morning I was fast asleep. How often does that happen? Often. There, there really is no schedule. Do you watch much television? How do you stay up with what's going on in the, in the world? I watch television uh, selectively. Uh, I watch uh, news and public affairs programs, some of them. Uh, and I watch sports. Have you ever gone back and looked at your own family history? Not really. Uh, it, it, no. You have no idea where your folks came from originally? No. I, I, I guess uh, I don't know even the names of my grandparents. On both sides? On both, on both sides. Um, partly it's because I, I, I'm, an, I'm an orphan, uh, and uh, so that, there was that, that link was cut. But I, but I really don't know the names of the, of the grand, who, people who would be my grandparents and the adoptive uh, family either. Did you ever know your original parents? No, I have no, no, I, uh, my father died before I was born. Uh, and uh, I, my, I, my mother, uh, heavens, uh, I was so young that I have no memory whatever of her. You have had how many children? Two. How old are they today? Uh, 40 and uh, 35. That's John and Lorraine. Yes. Where do they live? I, I don't never discuss where they live. Let's quickly retrace your steps in life. Uh, how many places have you lived? Oh my gosh. I sure must run into a dozen or two. Started where? Born in Gastonia, North Carolina. A little town about 15 miles from Charlotte, which is where my earliest memories are of Charlotte. Uh, moved up to Harlem and when I was eight years old. Uh, went in the, and went to, uh, down to Washington in 1950, worked as a GS2 clerk for the government. Came back to New York, was drafted into the Marine Corps, a couple of years there. Uh, off back to Washington, went to Howard University at night on the uh, GI Bill while I was working for the government today. And then I uh, decided that I, would I wasn't getting anywhere intellectually. I thought, this, this is not going to make it here. And so I started writing away to places. And the only place that would uh, give me any money was Harvard. So it was my fallback place. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciated the way they, 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 they were, the frankness they had. Because they wrote to me first that you should not withdraw from where you are. Because chances are you will not be admitted. And which, is, which was, you know, I was a 20 four-year-old high school dropout who had a B minus average at a mediocre college. And so, you know, uh, and so, but said, but we'll wait to see what the test results were. And, two, and a couple of days before I took the SATs, Columbia sent me their rejection. Uh, and I took the SATs, I did very well on it. And so the letter came back and it said, uh, I'm not sure we're doing you a favor, because by then the scholarship money was going anyway, uh, but you're admitted. And in those days, you couldn't give us transfer student a scholarship. And so they, they would simply lend me some money, and I then would have to come up with the rest of it to cover that first year, betting everything that I would do well enough the first year that there would be a second year. And as I look back on it now, I know so much more about the situation and the odds. I realized that was an incredible gamble. And, and did you ever get your high school diploma? Never. And so when, I, when, I, when I've taught at some of these expensive places like Cornell and Amherst, I've sometimes told the students, do you realize your parents are paying all this money for you to be taught by a dropout? You got <laughs>